Good morning, King's College. This is Sean Tabor. I'm here to do a, a presentation for you on Middle Eastern drumming for dancers. Thank you so much for coming, and I'll be happy to share anything that I've got. At the end of the presentation, we're going to be sharing a slideshow so that you can review anything, listen back over the rhythms, and do whatever you need to to practice so you can join our drum circles in the future. So who is this class for? This is for people who say, hey, I just bought a drum. Or maybe I don't know what the rhythms are called, but I know what I like, and I like playing that one. And I want to play with others, not just play all alone by myself. Welcome to the circle. So in the beginning, there is a heartbeat. Heartbeats are the very first root music we hear, before voice, before instruments. Drums create the rhythms of life. They are the stir of the heart, the breath, and the feet. Building a rhythm, everything starts with the heartbeat. The loudest drums are usually going to play the simplest rhythms. You want to listen for the rhythm between the beats. As you listen to the rhythm goes on, you'll find your own addition. When you make space between the beats, drummers of the past will sit in on with you. Many is a time when you're playing with somebody that you get into that synchronicity. And at the end, you go, wow, that was a really good counter major. How'd you do that? Because I thought you did that. So a lot of times you get these other drummers coming in as the beats integrate. So when we drum, we touch history. And this is a picture of one of the oldest drums, still a clay drum with a hide head. And it was over 7,000 to 3,500 years before Christ is what they've dug up so far. The neurology of drumming is very interesting. So drumming can actually make you smarter because when you drum, you access the entire brain. The research shows that the physical transmission of rhythmic energy to the brain actually synchronizes the left and right hemispheres. So when the logical left hemisphere and the intuitive right hemisphere of your brain begin to phase or pulsate together, your inner guidance system, your intuition becomes stronger. Drumming also appears to lower the areas of the brain, nonverbal, connecting them with the frontal, vertical, frontal uh, and now we have another person coming in. Hello. Uh, so drumming also appears to synchronize the lower areas of the brain, the nonverbal, with the upper forebrain, the language and reasoning. The physical stimulation of hitting the drums can actually release your nonverbal emotions, and you can actually literally drum out your feelings. This integration produces feelings of insight and certainty. It also helps a nonverbal person communicate, and they've done this in music therapy with uh, people that have Alzheimer's and some of the other dementia problems. There was a lady who was unable to express herself and she kept getting angrier and angrier. They were putting her with a drum and asking her if she could actually drum out just the feeling that she had. And she started going boom, 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 boom. And then they asked her to try and put words to it. And she was saying, I hate spinach. I hate spinach. Because they kept feeding her spinach and she really didn't like it, but she couldn't express it. And so she kept getting spinach. So the integration allows us to access more parts of our brains. Also, the sound of drumming creates new neuronal connection in all parts of the brain. The more connections that can be made, the more integrated our experiences become. And this leads to a deeper sense of self-awareness and a greater sense of community integration. Often when hunters would return from the hunt, you would have a feast and a dance to share with the tribe the the hunting experience and how they got this wonderful meal that just came in. Also, shamans will use drumming as a means to integrate the mind, body, and spirit. They may focus on the whole body, and then they will integrate the healing at both a physical and a spiritual level by drumming. Maybe. The basic hits, the Doom Con Tech, are pretty much all over YouTube. So since you've got access to YouTube, you can play along with those songs until you feel comfortable with the basic technique. This class is going to be more covering the rhythms that go with those different techniques and how to play with the circle. You also can watch other people in the circle to get the idea of which hand motions work best for that particular rhythm. So you want to listen, follow, then lead. Listen to the beat, 
at the speed and tempo that's being established. You want to listen to the flavor that's added on top of the beat and then listen to the nuances or the subtle accents within that rhythm. Let it flow through you, then join with it, immerse yourself in it, and surrender to your drumming and dancing, and you will find your contribution. You want to listen not only as the rhythm begins, but all throughout. Listen with your ears, listen with your skin, feel the beat, listen with the eyes, watch what the drummers and dancers are doing, and listen with your heart to feel the energy of the beat. Continually showing off, loudly demonstrating individual drumming skills and stuff is not helpful. The drum circle is a cooperative way of bringing everyone together and synchronizing. So listening to everyone, communicating with the other drummers, and serving the growing unity of the rhythm is the most helpful. So drum circles should be in layers. There are three roles that a drummer can play in a circle. The heartbeat drummer is usually playing the rhythm of the piece very steadily and predictably. He or she is going to find the groove and stay with it. These drummers maintain the foundation of the music. Without them, the entire piece of music collapses. The embellisher plays between the beats. He's going to be adding accents, syncopation, and other polyrhythms to add musical complexity and character to the piece. The lead drummers create kind of a creative and yet logical music on top of it. You can think of this as kind of the lead guitar fills in a rock band. The only sin a novice drummer can make is to be the loudest drummer in the room. You got to be patient. Listen first, find your contribution, then play. Whenever possible, novices should seat themselves next to the heartbeat drummers because they're going to be the ones that help you establish your sense of rhythm and tempo and are less likely to throw you off than the embellishers and the lead drummers and your fellow novice as well. Soloing. Don't fill up the space with your notes. You need to leave enough rhythmic space in the circle for other players to express themselves. You want to share the solo space. The solo air can get pretty thin up there. Usually it only accom uh, accommodates more one or two people. Think kind of like dueling banjos. So you want to pass the rhythm around to the circle to other drummers so they can find their contributions, as well as out to the dancers and back to the drummers. It's a lot of fun to play with the dancers when you can do a rhythm and see it modeled with the dancers. The dancers can do a rhythm and see it modeled with the drummers. The unwritten rules of the circle. First, don't wear rings, watches, jewelry, bracelets, anything like that when handling drums. The drum it may be ceramic and it might not scratch it or it might actually cause a drum to shatter depending on how deep a scratch you get. So shedding the jewelry is also going to protect your hands. If you're hitting and you've got a metal ring on, that's going to start to create a bruise and or a blister after a while. So if as your hands are drumming, they tend to swell. And if you have any jewelry that's kind of tight, if you swell up also, it may be causing you a circulation problem. So lose the jewelry before drumming. You also want to ask permission before playing anyone else's drum. Some drummers, their instruments are very personal and they don't want anybody else touching them. Also, it doesn't, needs to be said, but it shouldn't need to, don't sit on any drum. Um, Mistress Mia has had a drum ruined because somebody thought it was a stool, sat on it and broke it over at uh, BAM, I believe it was. So yeah, don't sit on drums. Listen as much as you play. By listening to what's going on around you, you're gonna have a better sense of how to fit into the groove that's being created. And you wanna play at the volume of the group. If you can only hear yourself, you're probably not having a constructive relationship with the rest of the players in the circle. And the old joke goes, how do you fix a drummer who's the liveest one in the group and is playing kind of off key? You hand him a beer because then he can only drum with one hand. And then how do you fix a drummer who is kind of offbeat and he's not really catching what they're doing with the rest of the group? You hand him a second beer because with two beers, he can't drum. So after you've solved those you know, rules of life, you don't want to worry even if you think you're rhythmically challenged. When you get started and you're listening to the rhythm, you're going to find rhythms inside of you you didn't even know you had. And this may be your heart. This may be your breath. This is what you're listening to and giving back to the rhythm. A closed circle doesn't invite. Yes, it's great to sit there and drum with each other, but what we're really here for is dancers. 
you want to be able to integrate the music with the dance. That's kind of what you're there for. Drumming inspires the dance through the rhythm, but the dancers inspire the drummers through their movements. Unibrows and layers. Nobody likes unibrows. Nobody likes unibeats either. They're boring to listen to and really boring to dance to also. You want to have a lot more flavor. The way you get your flavor is layers. Layers are richer, layers sound a lot more complex, and layers are more inclusive for the drummers and the dancers. If you have multiple layers in a piece, the dancer is going to be able to find something that works with their particular dance, as well as someone else over here dancing will have a rhythm that works with their particular dance. So building layers, how do you do that? Layers are built from the heartbeat, which we've talked about. Adding embellishments to give it more flavor, where you're going a little more, the syncopation coming in, or if you're going to have different rhythms on top of the rhythms. Also, your lead drummers can step in and they can do kind of rhythm play back and forth amongst themselves. It adds a little bit of spice to it, but it's like cymbal crashes. A little is a good accent, a lot can tend to be distracting. You want to end it with a hagala or transition over to the next rhythm. You might be wondering what a hagala is. We're going to go over that in a little bit. First, let me kind of give you some history of the erkat rhythms. So the erkat rhythms are the named rhythms of the Middle Eastern music. And with the markat scale system, this is how improvisation music is shared amongst the musicians in the style. The names are descriptors and are trying to make it easier to remember and communicate these rhythms to other uh, cultures. They were actually formally codified in the 18th century. However, musical archaeologists say that it was a much older period that these rhythms were constructed in, and it was just codified in the 18th. Period sources extant to it are showing that these are much older. So you want to have the M&Ms and the ABCs. The Erkat rhythms consist of Malfouf, Masmudi, Ayub, Belady, and Shiftateli. And with these basic rhythms, you can sit in on any circle. So the history of Malfouf. Malfouf is actually a term for cabbage roll. So it has a rolling quality to it, and it is considered the most basic Erkat in Arabic, in Arabic music. So it has a rolling quality that you'll see in just a moment. So this is Malfouf. Very simple. I'm going to move this over here. So as you hear, it's just a very simple rolling beat. Then you're going to be doing a little bit more embellishment on it. So this is where a second drummer would come in and add just a little bit more of accents. Go ahead and turn the volume up on that just a little bit. It's hard to hear. Got it. Let's try it again. Maybe. Okay. Can you hear that? It falls off after the first few seconds. Okay. The volume, unfortunately, is the highest it gets on that. So if anybody can adjust their speakers for that. Does okay. anyone want to have that hear it again? Go ahead and play it one more time. Sure. Okay. So then you're going to be adding even a more embellishment. So all of these different rhythms are going to have multiple layers to them. When you play them all together, that's where you get your, your rich sound. Okay. Now what we want to do is actually hear them build on each other so you can hear what it would be like in a drum circle where you add the embellishments and then you add some of the folks coming in on top.
go ahead and pause for a moment. I think it's getting feedback as a reason why the sound's dropping out. Go ahead and drop your volume a little bit. And I don't know where your microphone placement is, but that may be the issue because you can hear it for the first one, two, three, four. Okay. It's about seven bars and then it starts Ready to drop. Ready to try out. it again? Mm-hmm. Okay, was that better? Yes, it was. Um, you can turn up your speakers at home and actually hear the accents. Okay, great. So Masmudi is a very popular style and it's specific <clears throat> to Arabic music. It's almost impossible though to pin down. So that usually is referred to as the Erkat family instead of a particular rhythm. The word actually means poisoned, but it's also used as a surname. So there you go. If you have any Borgia fans out there, that's a rhythm for them. So everyone plays this differently. And there is a small or four time uh, Sogir version. There's also a large or an eight time Kabir version. The difference is more a, a matter of music theory, accenting cultural fills. Yeah, we don't care about that. So we're actually going to be uh, calling what's most commonly used as a mass moody in SCA drum circles. So the Masmudi is a very simple beat. It's usually coming in when you're having a beginning of a slow dance for the dancers to kind of get warmed up to. How is that uh, volume wise? I can hear it on my end. Okay, great. Coming in with a little more embellishment on it, though, gives it a lot more flavor. And then if you want to get a little more accents with it, So in the progression, this is kind of what it sounds like if you were going to be in a drum circle. Also, if anybody is attending that can't hear anything clearly, please let us know. All right, another Urkot rhythm are named after people. Ayub is a first and it's also a surname in Arabic. It's also translated in English as Job. This has nothing to do with the biblical figure or the Quranic figure uh, prophet as far as music archeologists have been able to figure out. However, it's a common trance rhythm and is at times used for religious purposes. It's very popular due to its ability to drive music at any tempo. And Ayub is also what's called a bridge rhythm. Basically, if you're playing Ayub, you can play any other music on top of it or continue to play when the drum circle itself switches from one rhythm to another. And Ayub accents will actually fit with almost every other music. You can also hear this music contemporarily because it's bass beat on a lot of Latin American rhythm songs. And if you listen, it's kind of like Pachelbel and D. 
once you hear Ayub, you will hear Ayub everywhere. So this is your basic beat for Ayub. And a little bit different variation. And this is kind of how the progression works. So Belody is an Arabic term for the countryside or rural areas. This rhythm is associated with uh, Falini or common people. In Egypt today, it's performed with particular dress and dance style that's part of a stylized entertainment in nightclubs. But Belody in the Middle East is technically any rhythm that's not considered sophisticated or kind of hit by the <clears throat> peoples playing it. Outside of the region and in the SCA, it's more popular rhythm, and it's considered a type of Masmudi rhythm. So if somebody tells you that another rhythm is Belody, know that Belody is in the eye of the beholder. And you're both probably right. So Belody sounds like this. And it's another very nice slow rhythm that allows the dancers to get into the flow of the beat. Take it down a notch if you've been having a very fast driving beat like Ayub or Mas Moody, something like that. You can add a few more accents to it. Hi. Hey. Hi, Evan. Sorry I'm late. Hey, I'm glad that you came. And we'll have a recording for you. So if you want to catch up on anything you missed before, that's fine. Thanks. Um, All right. So what we're doing is showing progressions of different beats. So this is your ability progression from a heartbeat, a very simple version, to a little bit more complex version with a few more accents in it, and kind of how it would sound like in a drum circle. All right, so shift to telly is a, actually a Turkish rhythm that's kind of migrated and become popular throughout the Middle East. It drifted into popular Arabic music around the 20th century, but for scholarly purposes, it's more of an Ottoman or Turkish music, and that's how it's used today. It's also the name of a popular folk dance in the Balkans in Eastern Europe, so it's characterized by more as pauses and the way it cycles and sets. Some dance and music eth ethnographers believe it evolved from a Eight, four, eight, four time signature and was probably originally an odd time signature like a seven, eight. So this is your shift to telling. And this is your shift to telly with a little bit more accents.
And this is more like what you hear in the essay. Okay, so this is the progression of how it would sound like, beginning with the heartbeat and then adding several layers on top of it until you get a nice complex layer. Excuse me. Uh, yes. How does the SCA version of Tutteli differ from the normal one? It has a few more syncopations as you listen to it. So it's doom, tuck, tuck, doom, tuck, but doom, 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 tuck, tuck, doom, tuck, 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 doom, doom, tuck, tuck, doom, tuck, tuck. So it's adding a few more embellishments. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so we'll finish this out and then we'll go to the next one. Uh, sorry, that restarted. Okay, I also want to talk a little bit about transitions. A lot of times what will happen is you'll have a drum circle start a rhythm, but then when it comes time to change that rhythm as it becomes boring for the dancers or for the drummers or for both, it kind of either slowly dies a horrible death until somebody decides to pick something back up and then it slowly kind of comes up. I think a little more professional way of doing it is transitioning via hand signs because transitions Normally, you have a few signals that people will give out, but they're not really communicative as far as where you're trying to go next. And that makes it hard to read the crowd and read the, the dancers and make the music appropriate to them. A lot of times you'll have a voice command like, hop, hop. The problem is, is it's kind of hard to hear if you're in a large group and it doesn't communicate a whole lot, except maybe you're gonna speed it up, slow it down. It's just more of a, hey, attention over here. And then you're supposed to in telepathically intuit what the guy's wanting you to do. A foot signal is very common to be used in both folk music and in Middle Eastern. And that's where you just stick your foot up. And that it's kind of hard to see, especially if you've got a bigger drum. And it only says stop. So it doesn't really give you a whole lot of information again. The Hagala rhythm is the one that you've heard. And we'll go through that in just a moment more, uh, which is a stopping beat. So it fits over any other rhythm and it signals the entire drum circle to stop on a specific time. And it's like a doom, ta, ta, doom, ta, ta, doom, ta, ta, doom, doom, doom. It's usually what it's used for the stop rhythm. Hand signals are kind of what I prefer because you can use it to change up to five different rhythms and you can alternate between these to read the crowd, read the dancers, speed it up, slow it down. It gives it a little more professional feel because everybody changes at once and changes to the next piece. And it allows, enables the, the lead drummer to more precisely read what the crowd wants at a specific time. You also wanna pace yourself and the dancers. You might start with a fast rhythm, go to moderately fast, then slow it down so the dancers can kind of breathe a little bit and end it with a live fast, high energy rhythm. And that gets the crowd wanting more for your next piece. You want to adjust the pace of the dancers. This is not about killing the dancers through speed. This is about tasty, um, precise drumming that enables them to show off their different movements. And it's helpful if you're able to both put the movement out there that you see so the dancer can dance to it, but also watch the dancers because their rhythm should be influencing what the drummers play. 
hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Drumming is an aerobic activity. And if you drum for hours, you're going to have swollen hands. You're going to have a very dehydrated body and probably a headache if you don't keep your water intake up. So please, while you're drumming, have something to drink. So what is a hagala? The hagala is a specific set of music that will go over any other kind of music and allows you to have a complete stop with the entire group. So this is the hagala. Pretty simple, pretty easy. When it's time for a drum rhythm to end, let it end. One of the most annoying things in a circle are those one or two people who just won't let it end. No, we can get this going. Just keep going. The dancers will come up off the ground. They're just resting. They'll be fine. You want to be able to get everything ending at a time so you can get a new rhythm. You don't want to start the same rhythm over and over and over. That may be the only one you know, but it is not the only one the dancers want to dance to, the audience wants to hear, or your fellow drummers want to play. So try and introduce novelty and a change of pace in between the rhythms. The temptation of new drummers is everything is going to be fast, high energy, full of sound. But there's a great value in pieces that are slow, syncopated, sensuous, containing some silence. The rhythms please the dancers. And they also leave room in there for a piece to build up to an exciting level and get some high energy as it evolves from a simple rhythm to more complexity. So what are the hand transitions? These are ones that I have made. I find that it works pretty well whenever I'm playing, and I encourage other people to try and go with them. I usually use number one for Malfu. It's a very quick, easy rhythm, can be used for a lot of different things. And just to remind you what Malfuf is. So quick, easy. When you want something a little slower, you've been going through Malfuf and it's like, well, now it's time to slow it down just a little bit. Mas Moody is a nice transition. All right, third one is going to be R.I.U., which is the bridge beat that goes over any other music. Followed by Belody. And finally, our shift to telly. All right, so these rhythms are not the only ones you want, but this is just the order that I tossed them in there. What this enables you to do is if you're playing a Mas Moody and you notice that people are getting bored, you might shift into an IU. Or if you're playing a melody and people are getting, you know, you need to slow it down from a malfouf maybe, try picking up a melody. But this just gives you a signal. And as long as everybody agrees what the number of fingers were in, it's easier to work with when you're playing as a group. The stop rhythm is a hagala, which again is our happy little And that just allows everybody to know when to stop. So this is the progression, basically practice track. If you want to practice shifting from one uh, rhythm to the other smoothly so that everybody shifts at once, I put this in here so that later on when you can access these slides, and I'll be making all these slides available on uh, in the King's College track, that way you'll be able to access the slides, play along with the rhythms, and get comfortable with shifting from one rhythm to the next. And so this is what that sounds like. I know this the Mas Moogie is an eight is a four four. Uh-huh. Isn't it only an eight four? 
it is, but it works well at this speed with this. It's, it's mainly to get the speeds correct between the different rhythms. So you can use this track to kind of just play along with them all at once, get used to shifting between one and the other. And that way it'll be a little bit less jarring when you're in a group and everybody shifts over immediately. So let's talk a little bit about Hofla anatomy. When you're watching a dancer, you're looking for specific body cues to let you know what to do. The first one is her hands will go up when she wants to be faster. Her hands will go down when she wants to slow down. If you see a dancer going down, going down, going down, she really needs to rest. You don't need to be giving her a fast beat to dance to. You also want to check out the ribs because dancers will typically use the rib isolations to accent pieces. And it's a little bit like if you're wanting to, to draw attention to them, use the higher notes on the drum to try and model the movement from the dancer. The hips are more of your heartbeat or your hip beat. It's slow or it's fast, but it's hard and heavy. And that's usually the deeper tones of the drum that you want to follow. And finally, there's the eyes. You may meet, look up, rise from your drumming to meet the eyes of approval. But if you've been going too fast, you may eat the glare of death. No one likes the glare of death, especially the drummers, because then you don't have anyone to play for. So in conclusion, listen to the heartbeat. Keep it simple with the M&Ms and the ABCs. Follow the flow of the rhythm and you will find your place in it. Be playful and pass on the lead to around the circle and out to the dancers and back into the drummers. Open the circle to invite people in. Don't just sit in the circle by yourselves. Listen in the silence for the rhythms of the past. Any questions? And just to let you know, you have about five minutes left of your class time. All right. I'm sorry I was late. I couldn't get the link to work. It's OK. Technology doesn't always play along. <laughs> Luckily, um, the instructor is going to be kind enough uh, in the chat to post where the information can be found. So that way, you can go through all the slides and actually have a, a better opportunity to, to listen to what he played, because I know sometimes the volume feedback um, wasn't uh, very kind. Oh, thanks. Oh, I raised my hand. I was going to ask you something. Uh-huh. I play a Rick. I mainly play a Rick, but I can also belly dance and play the Zills. Right. I was wondering, did you cover any uh, Rick stuff? Can any of this? Well, we, the Rick can be played with those rhythms also. So it's for the Dumbek and the Rick, but they're basic Middle Eastern rhythms that are common to all of the drum circles. Oh, because I was asking how you managed, how this can be pulled off on a Rick, because I saw your music and it was all like, it was all bongo stuff. Yeah, the reason I chose the bongo is it was a very distinct tone between low and high. So it gets the rhythm out there, but it's not designed to be a, this is a recording of it being played well. It's a simplistic recording showing you the way the beat is constructed. Oh, so it's not like a recording of a doom back uh, doing all this stuff. It the felt what? a little confusing because it wasn't like, uh, it felt a little confusing because it wasn't like a proper doom back or a Rick sound. I, it felt yeah. like it just sounded uh, there wasn't really a proper sound that we could find that conveyed the simplicity of it because anytime you went into the the like digital doombeck sounds uh it got a little bit because you would have several different doombeck sounds coming in over the top of each other it got a little muddy and that's why we were using the bongos because it was the simplest sound that we could find that denoted the low and high note to show the rhythm ah okay so thank you for telling us all about the dancer <clears throat> watch for dancers and stuff playing i was playing for dancers at a war one time uh-huh 
It ended up quite well. It made me actually want to get some Zills. I mean, want to learn ballet dance and also get the Zills. Zills are a blast. Zills are a lot of fun because sometimes the dancers will do them by themselves. Uh, other times they appreciate the rhythm section doing the Zills for them so they can concentrate on dancing and embellishing off of the rhythms. Interesting. Have you noticed any uh, wars where, or places where this was done where the rhythm section actually did the Zills for the dancers instead of the dancers normally playing the Zills? It, it's been done at BAM before. Now it depends on uh, what you want to have done. So like with the with the dancer, they may have a specific accent because the dancers have accents with the ribs and with the zills and anything else high um, that they may be doing and they like to be in charge of when that's occurring. You know, you don't want to have a cymbal solo throughout the entire piece. It gets a little boring. So they may use it accidentally. But if you are in part of the rhythm section, uh, sometimes it's hard to dance and zill at the same time, especially during the faster sections. So I find the dancers appreciate, or at least it adds something to the drum circle itself to do the zills within the drum circle. And then the dancers kind of accent it maybe if they have zills also. And sometimes they'll pick up what you're doing in the circle and it passes out to the dancers and you hear the rhythm reflected in what the dancers are doing. And that's a lot of fun. Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. You guys can Actually, feel free to continue to discuss. Yeah, there's one more slide that we'll do. If oh, okay. We add on that. So basically, we're looking forward to playing with everybody. And that's going to be the next lesson. So just let me know when you're ready for that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the class. I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording. And Thanks so much. Thank you.